Okay, the ones that were at camp. It is a normal thing that you're going to feel a letdown this week. So that's normal. Don't worry about that. Just work through it. Okay, Genesis 20. And then Proverbs 18, verse 19, one verse. And then Luke 17. And let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand these ideas and help us to do what we can to help others that have endured or have gone through some, uh, some offenses of life. And I do pray you'd help us to be able to deal with our, each and every one of our offenses. Help us to understand your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Genesis 20. Uh, this fellow named Abimelech, one time I preached a message called Abimelech the Great. You, know, you hear of Alexander the Great and Cyrus the Great, and I don't know if they were that great, but I think this guy is pretty great. I think this guy is a pretty good guy. Uh, I think he's of African descent, but he is a, an amazing individual. And you'll see the qualities that I'd like to point out about his life in Genesis 20. Okay, it says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerah. Okay, so this is south Israel. This is what uh, in the Bible called Philistines area. Uh, today, Palestinians are actually Philistines. Okay, and then we see what Abraham did. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. So he'd like to see if she's going to be a prospective wife. Okay, so that night, it says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, I'd bet it'd be a pretty bad dream, would it not? And that's one of those dreams, you have something like that, and then you kind of wake up, and, oh, what was I dreaming? Man, oh, man. That's the first time the word dead is found in the Bible, okay? And it's, uh, it's given a fella a death sentence. A decree has been declared that uh, he's going to have a death sentence if he doesn't do anything about it. Okay, and this is, but Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, so he's kind of woken up, that woke him up, he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she even her, she herself said, he is my brother in the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Okay, and the Lord's going to back that up. He's right. He didn't know about this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. Now, how would you feel about that? I know how I'd feel. Why would I want that guy to pray for me? He's a bald-faced liar and could have caused my death. They say first impressions are lasting impressions. Not with, not with this man. That's why I admire this man. Okay, this was, this was pretty raunchy behavior by Abraham and Sarah. Okay, and of course we know how the Bible, uh, they have a special place, but... I bet you at verse 7, if you, if you delve into the Hebrew, he would say, Are you kidding? You know, and when he says, For he's a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. I don't want that guy praying for me for what he did. That would be the natural inclination. But this, this is what's uh, admirable about this man, Abimelech. And the Lord says, And thou shalt live, and if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham, said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee? That's the first time that word's found in the Bible, offended. Offend, offense, offend. 
first time that's found. What have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And that's true. He's right. He is absolutely right in that statement. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? He's trying to figure out, why did he do this? And Abraham said, Because I thought, mm -hmm, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. No apologies. No saying you're right, I was wrong. No saying I was wrong. A continual self-justification. She is my sister. Yeah, that's a half-truth. She is the daughter of my father and not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy, kind this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, <clears throat> he is my brother. <clears throat> okay, now, watch what Abimelech does. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him, his Sarah, his wife. He gave gifts to this man who could have caused his death. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases thee. Whoa, what, what an individual is this? Wow, we, wouldn't you have been tempted to run him out of town? I would have, I would have felt that way, and anybody that's honest would have felt the same. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. That's kind of a gentle, a gentle little dig. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other thus she was reproved pretty nice he boy was he nice he was so kind and gracious in his reproof so abraham prayed, prayed unto god and god healed abimelech and his wife and his maidservants and they bare children for the lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of abimelech because of sarah abraham's wife now if you keep reading through genesis you'll find the same man occurs again and or some say it's his son, but still the same events take place again, and the same man amazingly, amazingly overcomes the offense. Okay, if you would, Proverbs 18, verse 19. I, I, I am amazed with that man. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody preach about Abimelech besides myself. Of course, I had to hear myself because when I was talking, my ears heard me. And so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Proverbs eighteen nineteen. Now we've all experienced this. I would dare say, a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Okay, that's under point two, Luke chapter seventeen. Okay, in the account with Abraham, there's no record of an apology, an honest, direct apology of Abraham to Abimelech. No, there's no record of that. There is a self-justification, or what we could call a fundamentalist apology. It goes something like, I'm sorry, you're not smart enough to understand what I was saying. <laughs> okay, something like that. Uh, Luke 17, okay, in this one, it's quite clear then said Jesus, then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Okay, the, since Adam sinned, offenses have taken place. Okay, usually when offenses take place, who usually gets blamed? Adam started that. When Adam and Steve, Eve, Steve, not Steve, definitely not Steve. When Adam and Eve was, when God came to them, and, and they confessed their wrong, who did Adam blame? It was the woman that you gave me. Who was he directing his blame to? He was blaming God. And often that's what happens. Okay, but in this case, Luke 17, 1, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. 
It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, Luke only puts one verse to that thought process. It's the only thought that I can recall that Jesus referenced a death sentence. And Matthew gives 10 verses for this one verse. So to fully understand what he's talking about in verse 2, you've got to go back to the cross-reference of Matthew 18, read 1 through 10, <clears throat> and you see what he's actually referring to. Okay, so he's talking about an offense, and we might, we'll uh, come over to that a little bit. Then he says this, Take heed to yourselves. <clears throat> if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent... Forgive him. That's a command. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, the apostles, obviously anybody, will say, are you serious? Now, the apostles, again, if you delve into the Greek, they will say, are you kidding me? And then in unison, they say, verse 5, Lord, increase our faith. So that's a demonstration of faith, is when we can offer the forgiveness. But what do we do if there's no, I mean, Abimelech wasn't, Abraham did not ask Abimelech to forgive him. And amazingly, Abimelech moved forward. And actually listened to some things that Abraham said in spite of Abraham's behavior. May, uh, that Abimelech is quite a character. I would encourage you to look him up and read about him. Now, when I refer to the word offense, okay, it can be an illegal act. Okay, it can be a breach of a rule. Uh, it's an intent to harm or to hurt another. And in sports, it's the attacking team, offense and defense. The offensive team is attacking. Okay, uh, have you ever... Um, ever since Adam sinned, a f man has offend continually offended man, and every one of us must deal with offenses. Every one of us. Okay, have you ever seen some MMA fighters where they just, just beat the snot out of each other, and after the match, they hug each other, pat each other on the back? Why? Out of respect. Even though that guy just busted my face open and I'm bleeding all over the place after the match, it's hugged. There's a sport in Florence, Italy. Amazing sport. It is a combination MMA, rugby, soccer, all put together. 27 guys on each side, and they're in this, uh, like a sand, not a sand pit, but it's a field about 125 feet. And all they got to do, all, all they have to do is take one ball from the other end and throw it over the edge into this net. That's it. And the net is the entire width of the field. That's all they got to do. But it is a combination MMA because right off the bat, of 27 guys, if you're trying to run a football through 27 guys, it's impossible. So about 10 or 12 of them immediately get in a fight, I mean, kick and, and punch and and grab and then just take each other down. And so you got about 12 guys in a bear hug in the dirt. So that now brings you down to about, you know, 15 that I got to dodge through. And, and sometimes when a guy's running past, he's trying to reach out and grab them. I mean, it is nothing but blood and guts. And half of them, over half of them, know they're going to get injured and be carried off the field. I mean, it is a crazy sport. It makes football look like a panty waist sissies. Got all their pads and everything. But it's amazing. But afterwards, these guys will go to a, a beer place together, probably. It's amazing. Okay, now I have noticed. Have you ever noticed this with some people that they can talk to you friendly, blah, blah, blah. And as soon as you mention Christ or the Bible, instantaneously a wall comes up. And it's all done. I'm going to try to help you get through that wall. Because there's something that's happened to that individual that when you mention Jesus or Bible, that triggered that memory and that pain came to the forefront and that wall, the bars of a castle are right there. And it stopped, but we can work through that. 
Okay, so I want to give you some thoughts this morning about overcoming the offenses of life. The first one, the range of offenses varies greatly. Okay, from a major, absolute major harm, like murder, that's an offense, but obviously you can't do much about that if you're the one murdered. Okay, but a grave offense to the hypersensitive, thin-skinned little sissies that's being occurred in America. That's still called an offense. That was prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24 when the apostles asked him about some signs of his coming. He said in Matthew 24, 10, he says, many are going to be offended. This is the whole root uh, idea of this political correctness, where people get offended by a word. If you just say something, you don't know, what did I say? And you can't even figure out. That's this hypersensitivity that Americans, why are, uh, are having to come across them is because they're madly in love with themselves and the world revolves around them. All these selfies, they think the world revolves around them. Okay, and so I'm not talking about that sissified type of offenses. I'm talking about, I mean, some real major offenses, things that really catch you off guard. Now, Abraham did commit a terrible offense toward Abimelech. And could have had some major consequences, but amazingly, Abimelech overcame it. Amazingly. In Matthew 18, that's the passage that I referenced in Luke 7, uh, 17, verse 2. If you read Matthew 18, you got to about 10 verses through there. And it's talking about a religious leader over children. And it talks about him offending children. This is a major offense, and it's such a major offense where Jesus says, the... Bible, my judgment on that offense is the death sentence by drowning. Okay, that would be a Catholic priest molesting an altar boy. That would be <clears throat> a Baptist preacher or staff member messing around with people in the church, kids in the church, youth in the church. That's what that would be. Okay, and that's where the Lord says... That is worthy of being drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, nobody's ever obeyed that order, and we have <laughs> no intention on obeying the order because that's up to God. But that's a major offense, okay? And uh, there are many grave offenses that occur within the family unit, within the family structure, and when, when, within a church structure. Now, the worst offenses, the ones that have the greatest, if we're going to call the word efficiency, meaning these offenses will go on, are the unexpected ones. It's like you get sucker punched. Those are the ones, because they're out of the ordinary. That's why when it often occurs within a family structure or in a church situation, it has grave and long-lasting effects on people, and many don't even overcome it. That's the ones where you'll see a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city because their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Okay, now, if you see the offense coming, you can brace yourself. I'll give you a couple examples. Okay, Jen and I, after college, we went out to Colorado. And was working under a fundamentalist guy, I mean, uh, and everything. And after about a year, year and a half, I, we can sense, hey, we need to do something to get out of here. We're learning a lot of things, but we're mainly learning how not to do things. And I, I had witnessed about eight staff families leave, all leave unhappy, all leave through an offense by the preacher. And I could see the offense was coming. And so when you could see a punch coming, you, you kind of get ready for it. Okay, and, and it came, and it came. I mean, uh, it was expected, but it came, and it was, it was a rough one, okay? And, but yet the Lord used that in a, merciful way, <clears throat> in a merciful way to get us from fundamentalism into the Bible-believing realm. So you're looking back on it, you can see, but at the time, the offense is, man, you're licking your wounds, okay? And so... Uh, that one, then there was a second one that was totally unexpected. This was in the Bible-believing realm. I mean, not only was I, and not literal, I'm not speaking literal, not only was I sucker punched, but I was kicked in the gut at the same time. And it just took the wind out of my sails. I mean, it took the wind out of my sails where I was basically 
want to say, forget this. If that's what it's all about, I'm out of here. Okay, and this was done by a seasoned veteran of the ministry that, every, man, the Bible believes just admired this. I mean, and I admired him. I mean, I had listened to so many things of his, but that behavior, when that sucker punch and kick in my gut hit me, it was just like, wow, I didn't see that coming. I mean, it was nothing more than the insecurity, the actions was an insecurity of a bully. I mean, that's what it was. I mean, if you narrow it down, that's what it was. And these, both of these behaviors were actually the actions of a bully. You ever deal with a bully? A bully's never wrong. And a bully's a steamroller that's going to steamroll over you. And, and if he's going to get you in submission, that's the, that's the intent. Now, my nature is not to be yelling back at somebody. I, I see these uh, coaches, managers of baseball. They get out and they get yelling at the umpire and they're kicking dust on them and all this stuff. I think, that's weird to me. When I coach basketball, I don't get technicals. If I had an issue with a referee, I waited to a break in a game and I walked over him very calmly and I just said, hey, could you, I don't know if you noticed this, could you kind of watch for this, please? Now, I didn't get a lot of action that way. But that's just not my nature to be yelling and screaming at somebody. And so when these things occurred, I just backed off. Quietly backed off. But that's what I experienced. I mean, that, that, that was a tough one. Now, his associate, several years later, told a friend of mine, boy, he got a raw deal. Yeah, that's about the limit of it. Two days later, after that experience, I preached from this pulpit on forgiveness. Why? Because I was I'm to forgive, even though I wasn't asked, because nothing was wrong on that part. A bully's never wrong. Okay, where you're going to tell them about it? No, that's not how it works. Okay, and so the idea is, is what do you do with those things? Okay, and so I see in both cases it purposely I what I did in both cases is that after the fact after the storm blew over I get right back in that person's presence now the fellow in Colorado we was out to go to Colorado again and I said we're out there and I said Jim let's go back to church see why because I didn't do anything wrong and I'm not going to let a bully think that he's going to intimidate me. And I sort of kind of knew he didn't like it that we were there. Why? Because a bully's insecure. And in fact, this gentleman actually told his daughter-in-law, why do they come here? Don't they know I hate that? Yeah, I knew that. Just quiet. Just walk in quietly and just be around it. It drives a bully crazy, generally speaking. And so in both cases, I just went right back to the situation and just quietly came around. I see bullying and manipulation is the behavior in most churches. That's how Gentiles think the way they're to be a leader, is by being a bully or manipulate. I see that's what most soul winning techniques are, is being a bully. Bullying somebody to my position. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ never mentioned hell to Nicodemus or the woman at the well? Never mentioned it. In fact, the gospel according to John never mentioned hell one time. Paul never mentioned hell one time. Philip did not mention hell to the Ethiopian eunuch. But how many of us heard somebody say, you're going to go to hell? I mean, the Muslims will say that to us. Christians will say that back to them. And it's almost like the way they say it, you're going to go to hell, and I'm going to be glad about it. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to mention hell. I'm not saying that. Okay, I'm not saying a person shouldn't preach on hell. But I've heard preachers say that Jesus preached about hell ten times more than he preached on heaven. No, he didn't. He didn't do that. 
Okay, and most soul winning techniques is basically scaring somebody to take this fire escape. How about preaching about Jesus Christ? Okay, again, I'm not saying we're not supposed to mention it as far as the Spirit of God leading us or guiding us in any conversation. I'm just saying that it appears to me that most of these techniques is nothing more than a bullying or manipulation. And that's not exercising free will. God just lays out the truth and lets a man take it or leave it. Just lays it out. You see? And so the idea there is what I've learned from these things is I just, when I, when I get in a situation where a bully is trying to push something on me, I just quiet down, step back, and I don't say a word. It's not my nature to yell back and get all feisty about it. That's not my nature. I just don't like doing that because I don't think that accomplishes anything. You see, when emotions are high, intelligence is low. Now, the most damaging offenses will occur from another believer. A parent, pastor, or a church. Why are those the most damaging? Satan gets the greatest advantage out of those type of offenses because we're caught off guard. I didn't see this coming. Smack right in the face. I didn't see that coming. It challenges the very foundation of the family and the church, and it creates the deepest and long-lasting wounds. And if you ever come across somebody who's experienced these things, and as soon as you mention the Lord, Bible, or church, you're going to see a wall come up. Why? A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city because their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So what do we do? Second thought, offenses wound the soul like injuries wound the body. Now, the Lord Jesus orders forgiveness... When requested by the offender, Luke 17, that is an order. You say, I can't do it. If the Lord grants an order, then he can give us the grace to obey the order. Okay, and then the emotional wound can, can be recalled. It can be recalled. Okay, a person can forgive, but you're still nursing your wounds. But yet as time goes on, as soon as that trigger is tripped, all those memories come back and that recall comes back and that pain comes back and hence there's that wall, the bars of a castle. I just was noticing a fellow recently when I was preaching as soon as I mentioned Lord Jesus, I happened to look at him and I talked about the Lord Jesus, accept the Lord Jesus, I could see his eyes just in the face. I could see hardness just like that. Something happened. Something happened that triggered that pain in that man. Now, a lot of times we don't know what to do. So what do you do if, if, if the good friend, you can sense the spirit of a good friend or a family member when something's going on. And so when you experience that, when you want to bring up the Bible or the gospel or some issue, a Bible viewpoint, and that contention has it manifested itself, that pain has manifested itself, just simply talk to the person. Hey, I, I could sense a resistance here. I could sense some pain that you're thinking about. Am, am I correct? Yeah. Would you like to talk about it? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to hurt you. It wasn't my intention to hurt you. I wasn't my intention to bring up something that's painful in your past, but would you like to talk about it? And, and weep with them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, I'm not saying you have to believe everything they say because, you know, there's always three sides to a story or three sides to a coin. We've got heads and tails on the edge, and the truth is usually on the edge. But I'm still saying there's a pain there you want to try to work through. And so what do you do? You ask for the reason and listen to their pain. You empathize with them. And reassure them of your friendship and concern for them. And if it was really a truly a grave offense, I'm not saying don't call him a liar. I'm, maybe, it, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't happen. I don't know. But just say, you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ is in agreement with you. 
That was wrong behavior. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't approve of that behavior. Now, that person may have been Christian. That person may be promoting the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus Christ does not approve of that behavior. And the Lord Jesus Christ cares for you in that situation. And and you can actually show them that, you know, in some cases, the Lord predicted this behavior to try to forewarn us. You know, dealing with a Catholic boy, I've seen Catholic uh, young men that want nothing to do with God, nothing to do with anybody about Jesus or the Bible, and because a Catholic priest offended them deeply as they're coming through there. And I'm a Baptist, I'm not a Catholic, but that doesn't matter. Because they see God and Christ and Bible all in the same realm. They've thrown everybody in the same basket. Okay, and sometimes you can try to work through them with it and say, hey, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ didn't approve of that. Bit. You know what? The Lord Jesus Christ said that man should be thrown in that depths of the sea. Just to try to help the person through it. It's the pain that they're thinking about. It's the hurt. The offenses wound the soul and injury, as injuries wound the body. The third thought is this. We can overcome the offense through the love, through love for Jesus Christ and his word. Okay, ideal verse, Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now, I pulled that on a guy one time where he was throwing a bunch of things at me. He said, well, I'm sorry if I offended you, brother. And I said, I just smiled. I said, I, you know, you couldn't offend me if you tried, because Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You see, I wasn't expecting offense in that. So I already had my armor on. Man, I had my defenses ready. I mean, already could see it coming. But when you get sucker punched, you don't see that. You don't see that coming. Okay? And so overcome the offense through the love for the Lord Jesus. Now, looking backward on both of those offenses that I told you about, the one was gloriously, both gloriously used by God to get me where God wanted me. And I thank God for it. I mean, the one was a shift from a fundamentalist to a Bible believer. The other was a shift from, don't put these Bible believers on that pedestal too high. They don't have the niche to all truth. You can find other areas. And I thank God for those things. I can't thank God enough for it. You see, with time, you can look back on the offenses in your life and say, that was God trying to make us stronger. That was the Lord trying to draw us closer to him. Why? Because who's been offended by more people than anybody? Jesus Christ is. He died for our offenses. So the third thought is this. You overcome the offense through the love for the Lord Jesus and the word of God. Now, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. Now, the continual pain will result, why? Because of this attitude, the offense was committed against me. So why was the offense committed against me? It's because I'm walking and breathing. Why? Because that's life. And if a person analyzes it, the offense that was committed against me... There are other people within their sphere of influence, friends, acquaintances, that have committed the similar offense, but it wasn't committed against me. And they could befriend that individual because their offense wasn't committed against me. It was committed against somebody. And the thing is that they're not demanding justice for this one because the offense was committed against me. The continual thought of the me is where bitterness steps in. You see, that's how the thing works. Now, justice and vengeance are very similar terms, but the the very fine line between some of these English words is justice is, is a good thing where a person trying to right a wrong For the sake of the offender, for their benefit, to help them. Vengeance is, I want them to experience the same pain, if not worse, than I have. That's vengeance. The motive of it 
is the difference. I, you know, I'm sure many of us will live long enough that you've seen two, a couple saying, I love, you know, all you and all this and blah, blah, three years later, four years later, several years later, when there's some grave offenses committed in there, the one will want to gouge the other's eyeballs out and use their eyeballs for marble games and enjoy it. That's vengeance. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. That's where faith steps in. And that's where we rely upon God. The body and the soul have a natural and a spiritual healing capability. Okay, but there are other ways that a person gets offended. And in Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist was stuck in jail. And he was tired of it. And the Lord made this comment. John the Baptist sent a couple messengers to Jesus. And uh, then Jesus sent some messages back, answered a message back. And then he turned to the people and he said, Blessed is he, whosoever is not offended in me. There's going to be some things the Lord puts in our lives, allows to take place, that are offensive to us because it's out of the ordinary. It's not normal. It wasn't what I was expecting. It, it went contrary to what I thought. And the Lord says, blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me. In John chapter 6, there's a strange, unusual idea that Jesus Christ gave. John chapter 6. It's where the Catholics and the Lutherans used to justify the Mass. Mark, or John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he's got to eat of me, has eternal life. Oh, you talk about a tough one. That's a weird idea. And that's where the Catholics have set up the Mass, and the Lutherans have adopted that idea. The more of the liberal Lutherans, the more conservative, a little bit different than the Missouri Synod. Okay, and that thing threw the disciples for a loop. Now, Jesus answered it in verse 57, where he said, As I live by the Father, so ye shall live by me. So he's saying, Spirit, I'm talking spiritually. But like the woman at the well, when Jesus was talking about the living water, she thought literal water. The Lord told them he was speaking spiritually in John 6, verse 63. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But a lot of times people overlooked that and the people at that time overlooked it. They were so shocked that he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's what he said. And they were so shocked when he said, I'm speaking spiritually unto you, that blew over their head. And a bunch of the disciples took off. It's only 666 in the New Testament, chapter 6, verse 66, and the disciples left him. And looked at the apostles and he said to the twelve, he said, you offended? Does this offend you? And then he gave them a stranger idea. I mean, he didn't back off from the idea. He said, this offend you, fellas? He said, you're going to see me ascend up in heaven. What? What are you, crazy? He threw another strange idea on them. He says, you guys taking off? And Peter said, where are we going? You got the words of everlasting life. You see, that's where a lot of people get. They start reading the Bible, and that, that Bible goes against our viewpoint. So what's the reaction? They get offended. Walk away from the book. Give God time. Give him time to explain those, to work in your spirit, to accept some of those things. The blessings, there are blessings when a person can accept the situation that God has allowed in their life and accept the ideas of the Bible that manifest the love of God and the eternal wisdom of truth. You know, that saying, all things work together for good. People will quote that verse, all things work together for good, and then they'll watch these Christian movies where they always have a happy ending on earth. Don't they? They always do. That's how Hollywood always does it. The, the, you know, the family struggles where they always solve the family issue within the 30-minute sitcom. That ain't reality. 
Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. That is based in the judgment seat of Christ. That's not based on earth. That offense, that trouble that you're going through may be something you're going through until the day you die. I hate to put it that way, but that's reality. And a reality is that it's going to work together for good at the judgment seat. The Lord is allowing things in our lives that we appear at that judgment seat perfect in Christ. Now, don't look perfect down here, but in Christ. That's what he's looking at. And at that judgment seat, we're going to wish we had... If we're going to wish we went through more trouble. Now, I don't wish that now. I don't want to be at that judgment seat in the line with uh, William Tyndale. No way. Apostle Paul, no way. No way. Put me at a different line. They got to have, you know, soft soap line, hardcore people. I'm in that soft, soft line. Okay? But still the idea, that's where all things work together for good to them that love God. And the thing is, is the Lord allows these things in our life. One is to toughen us up. One is to move us where he wants to move us, to give us an attitude he wants to change. And it's rough going through those things, but it's it's the best that God has for us. We overcome the offense through the love for the Lord Jesus Christ and his blessed word. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you help each and every one of us that if we have a friend maybe a sibling, maybe an acquaintance at work that we've been trying to witness to or been trying to tell them about the Bible. Maybe they're saved and trying to get them to the Bible-believing viewpoint, and we're, and we're hitting this wall. We're hitting this wall. Help us to climb the wall. Get over on the other side and understand their pain and help them through it. And Lord, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us to be able to overcome the offenses that's been committed against each and every one of us. Why? So that we can please you. So that you can be blessed. So that we can have faith believing your words. Well, heads bowed and eyes are closed. The piano will play. If you need to use the altar, it's open for you. Lord, thank you for your words. Thank you that uh, you've given us this roadmap of life. And I do pray and ask that you'd help us to understand your words, help us to understand uh, the offenses of others that we might uh, respond as you want us to. I pray you'd help us to accept these things, accept your will, and to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.